All right, good afternoon and welcome everyone to today's webinar. My name is Lisa Versace and I am the Programs and Engagement Manager here at the California Preservation Foundation. I'm also joined by John Haber, CPF's Field Services Director and our Education Committee Lead for this program, Braden Templeton. Uh, for those of you who may be less familiar with us and our work, the California Preservation Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization committed to ensuring that the rich diversity of California's historic resources and cultural heritage are identified, protected, and celebrated for their history and for their valuable role in California's economy, environment, and quality of life. Our work is made possible by generous support of our members, donors, and sponsors. Uh, if you're not already a member, we invite you to join this preservation community by going to californiapreservation.org slash membership. And our website is where you can also find information on future programs and events. Uh, today's program will feature the expertise of two speakers, Riley Dottie of Dottie Tile and Annie Dennis, uh, Education Director and Archivist at Palabic Pottery. Uh, Braden will serve as today's interviewer and moderator. Uh, thank you to the three of you for joining us for today's program. Uh, for our audience, if at any time during the program you have questions for our speakers, we encourage you to put them into the Q&A, uh, the box which can be found at the bottom of your Zoom window. We've set, a we've set aside time at the end of this program for questions, and we'll do our best to get to everyone's in the time allotted. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Brayden to get progr today's program underway. Brayden. Thanks, Lisa. Um, so again, here today with us is Riley Dotty and Annie Dennis. So I'll let them personally introduce themselves a little more. If you want to start with Riley. Oh, okay. We're starting. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, I started setting tile in 1997 in New York City. And at that point, I was, I was 28 years old. And I had done a lot of different things, and I was wondering if I was ever going to do any one thing. And when I started setting tile, I immediately felt I want to do this for the rest of my life. So anyway, so the next year I came to California because the economy was dead in New York at that time to get into a union apprenticeship. And I did uh, half of a four-year program. And I, I was a little idealistic. I didn't want to just do Pass all work really fast. I wanted to do really, really interesting things. So I so, so I went on, on my own and did everything that came along. And um, basically, I encountered uh, tiles in Cal California from, especially from the 1920s, the sort of golden age of, of tiles. And uh, got fascinated by the history of them. And I started. I. I I had about 5,000 pictures that I took going around San Francisco uh, and somewhat uh, San Jose and Oakland, uh, taking pictures of every single tile that could be seen from the street. Then I went to the library and I started going through architecture magazines. Then I met Tile Heritage Foundation, which was just founded in 1988, and that was life changing. Um, that's the Center for Information Central for All Things Tile. And um, I served on the board for 22 years up until last year when I retired, and um, I'm also a, as a I'm still a practicing tile setter, and and I belong to the artistic license a group of uh, barrier period artisans, and uh, I think that's it for me. <clears throat> Thank you, Annie. Hi, my name is Annie Dennis, and um, I'm the Education Director and Archivist at Pawabic Pottery, located in Detroit, Michigan, um, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Um, prior to this, my uh, background is in ceramics, so I have both my bachelor's and master's in ceramics, and my role here is really documenting and therefore sharing the historic tile installations done by our founder, which I'll get more into our um, kind of founding story in a bit. So I'm excited to be here today. Thanks to everyone for having me. Great, all right. Um, we'll get started with Riley um, showing your presentation. So I'll be sharing that, one second. Okay, take it away. Let's see. So I guess we will start. We're going to look at the Berkeley City Club. Uh, that was the, the connection between Annie's uh, work on the Detroit uh, Women's Club. So uh, let's see. So we're going, moving now to the to the uh, picture of the of the building. 
Yes. Okay. That's it. This is often called Julia's Little Castle because it was done concurrently with the long, long ongoing uh, Hearst Castle at San Simeon. Um, Ju Ju Julia Morgan was a, a, a pioneer of the, uh, uh, well, she was the first woman admitted to the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in, in Paris and she graduated, she finished in 1894. And uh, then she became the first licensed woman uh, architect in California. And uh, this building dates from 1930. Just It was completed just after the onset of the Depression. So yeah, so now I guess we can uh, go to the particular size. This is about 40. There are 42 resident rooms. And so each one has a patterned uh, uh, off-the-shelf uh, mo ceramic mosaic. So the main problems are that there's some nasty grout and there's a lot of little chips and dings. So this is the case that we can move through these. Let's see. I don't control that, do I? Uh, no, that's yeah. Me. Okay. So here, here we've taken them out, and here we've got it back, and it looks pretty spiffy, kind of like it did originally. So the next phase that we that I'm showing is let's see. This is a particular um, damaged. Uh, Drain board in a communal play, a part for, for for hotel guests called the 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 coffee corner pantry and people can go in get ice do a get make make stuff for themselves, but see the uh, the box cap in the front was split because of <laughs> poor construction okay, and then the things that happened I don't know why that exactly to on the backside so the main thing here was what was since we had to take out we took out enough to kind of redo the, the plumbing and copper so it would be good for the next century or whatever. And then coming down to the end, to the final. Yeah, so so this is back and you can't see any big difference because the main challenge there is to get um, glaze matches. That's a, a process with some back and forth and then getting approval and then getting the tiles produced. So this is an example of how, yeah, it, it works. To, it takes some patience and some time. Anyway, so on to the next, I think the, Oh, oh yeah. Oh, this is great. These are exploding doorways. You see, there were no expansion joints because the it wasn't such a thing then. It was a concrete slab with a mortar bed about an inch and three quarters, and then then the tile set directly on that. Now, if you were calling out expansion joints, every time that you go from a big area to a to a, another big area with a small area in between, that's going to get get messed up. It's going to, the stresses are going to, it's not going to be able to take it. So I redid seven of these and two of them exploded violently. It was pretty cool, like a gunshot. It happened all at once. It, 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 it absorbed stress, 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 stress until finally in one moment it just gave way. So that was very dramatic and unusual. So this is, this is when you take it out, I've got the, um, the Schluter Dietra and then around this is Decafoam to, to uh, make a, a flexible area between it and we go to the next one and then we this is after the tiles are put in and and, and after the uh urethane sealant is is put on the same thing that's used for commercial expansion joints and then the uh sand is immediately embedded into the uh the fresh uh, mixtures of, of sand and then here it is when it's done and the, the the tiles aren't a perfect match again we're always striving to to uh make it look like it it was original as much as possible with, without detracting and but here uh, there there are all around the perimeter there are now soft flexible joints so it should it will do much better and maybe completely solve the problem of of dealing with the stress so on to the next um picture yeah so this is a bad pat the 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 clubs withered away and didn't have enough funds all throughout the second half of the 20th century. More the deeper you got, the more problem it was. So here's where the handy person or somebody put in a patch that just really didn't match. So it's just digging it out. And then we go into the next picture. This is from the opposite side, but anyway, this is the area where it now doesn't jump out at you. And oh, let's see, we only have half of the swimming pool. Is that uh is that how that is? Well, okay, that's that's how that is. All right. <laughs> Moving on, it's really quite a lovely swimming pool. Anyway, so where the diving board was, well, the diving board, the insurance company said, well, next year we have to quadruple your the, the premium for, for the diving board. 
a lot of liability. So that was the end of the diving board. So the diving board had three things like this that were uh, supports for the for the platform for, for, for it. And, and so it was, uh, we wanted to heal it back together. So we had to cut out what was there and then go on to the next. This is a this is one of these quirky little stories. Okay, this is cutting out to 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 harvest and salvage uh, matching tiles. There they are, exactly the same as as on the pool deck. Uh, when you walked out from the dressing room in, 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 to the pool, you you originally had to walk through a, a solution of antifungal chemicals in a little four four inch deep pool in order to uh, prevent um, spreading foot fungus. So that was their idea then, that which was um, later um, discredited or whatever, it was, it was no longer. So uh, I didn't know anything about this, but, but there it was and, and it was revealed to me. So we took away the mats that, that, that made it, several layers of rubber mats that made it flush with the surrounding floor and harvested and cut out the pieces. So you're cutting them out into, into blocks and then to the next picture. Uh, yeah, so there's cutting them out and then uh, cutting them into these and then they cut into singles. So it was very, you know, there's like 100%, no, no, no breakage except where we had to cut the surrounding ones to do it. And I don't have a final picture of that because I didn't get back to the club uh, this week. I thought I would, but the days went by. But anyway, it didn't matter because it's invisible. <laughs> That's the point of it. It was, it was we were able to, to to get the same original tile. We didn't have to figure out how could somebody match that crazy little speckle and off white and rust color and you know. So anyway, so that was what we did. So I think I think that's that's my presentation. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, now we'll jump over to Annie with another Women's City Club in Detroit. Yes, thank you. Um, and thanks, Riley. That was really interesting. And I think it's kind of an interesting comparison point to what we do here at Boabic. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I also have a bit of a presentation. Um, and while we'll hear a little bit of similarities, there's also some differences because, um, you know, I'm representing an entire organization um, and we're kind of lucky to, um, can everyone see my screen okay? Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Um, and so, um, for those that aren't familiar, again, I'm, I'm here from Puabic Pottery, and um, and while we have some similarities with what Riley discussed with some of our projects, um, the big difference is that we're still a historic pottery that's still operating, and so we're kind of left um, doing renovations of, of some of our own work. So I'm just going to start with a little bit of an intro of the founding story um, and a little bit of um, Puabic's um, history for anyone that's not familiar. Oops, sorry, I just realized it was at the end. <laughs> there we go, good, okay. Um, so Puavik was founded in 1903 as part of the arts and crafts movement, um, which was really a response to the industrial revolution. And because of this, Puavik's pieces, um, especially our tiles, have always um, focused on and celebrated the handmade. Um, our founders, Horace Calkins and Mary Chase Perry, later Mary Chase Perry Stratton, um, they believed really strongly that the human hand was essential to the making process, especially the art making process. Um, and that, that line of thought was in stark contrast um, to that of the booming industrial scene of Detroit. It's kind of worth noting that Puabic was founded the same year as Ford Motor Company. Puabic is largely known for its handmade architectural tile, and that's a focus that was and continues to be the heart of our historic organization. And today, examples of these early Puabic tiles can be seen all throughout Metro Detroit and beyond on buildings downtown, um, in museums and libraries, in local homes, in our places of learning, and our most sacred spaces. And today, Puabic is proud to carry on this legacy of creating handcrafted tile um, right here within our National Historic Landmark Building in Detroit. And while an incredible amount of time has passed, things haven't really changed too much around here as we're following these really well-worn footsteps um, to create tile in nearly the same way and with some of the equi same equipment as our founding staff. And just like our founders, we're still tiling homes and gardens our schools and libraries, 
and even our stadiums and places of public transportation. And while the nature of handcrafted works means that each installation is unique, um, we appreciate the projects where we can truly look back uh, like that of the Women's City Club here in Detroit. Um, and this is a project with some special connections to Poabic Pottery. And again, a really interesting counterpoint to the work that Riley was doing there in Berkeley. Uh, first opened in 1924, um, this six-story building was once home to what was the largest women's city club in the world, um, as they boasted more than 8,000 members by the 1930s. And one of those members was our very own founder, Mary Chase Perry Stratton, who also served as a chairperson of the building committee um, for the construction of, at the time, what was the new women's city club. So, of course, there's Poabic tile work spread throughout the space, like this floral themed drinking fountain um, located in one of the main hallways. And this small abstract geometric mural in the main stairway glazed in bright primary and secondary colors, um, as well as a Poabic tiled pool on the main level, which I had to show because I knew Riley had worked on a pool. And this building was designed by William Buck Stratton and his partner, um, Dalton Snyder. Stratton was also the architect of our very building here at Poabic, as well as husband to the Poabic founder, Mary. And the Strattons had a profound impact on the building's appearance, which luckily is still standing tall uh, near Grand Circus Park in downtown Detroit. And we were thrilled when um, we were recently called by Olympia Development of Michigan to assist with the restoration of this nearly 100 year old building. Um, and this gave us a, a closer look at the tiles that were created by our founding staff, as well as the opportunity to participate in bringing it back to life. Um, so the following photos show areas where we focused our tile restoration and tile replacement efforts. Upon arriving at the entry, we're greeted by this doorway of really cheerful blue teardrop shaped tiles um, surrounded by warm buff iridescent glaze tiles. Um, since these are located on the exterior of the building, there were some tiles near the ground level uh, or the ground that actually experienced some damage due to Michigan's um, harsh freeze thaw conditions. Um, so that required a few tiles to be replaced. And similarly, there was an outdoor fountain on the roof of the building. Um, it was in need of some repair and tile replacement as the decades of exposure to Michigan winters took its toll on the really soft surfaces um, of Poabic's colorful hallmark iridescent glazes. And while the actual square footage of the tile that we replaced throughout the building was relatively small, the real challenge for us came in matching or at least closely resembling the historic Poabic glaze surfaces. Um, this is one of the most frequent questions that we get here at Poabic, but we actually don't use any of the original glazes formulated by our founder um, as they don't match any of today's health and safety standards. This here is a yellow glaze recipe from around the same time that the Women's City Club was developed. Um, is a good example as to why that is, as it contains both lead and uranium. Our talented staff worked close to closely match the variety of glaze surfaces found within this space <clears throat> using newly formulated glazes set within the surviving old tiles. And while we watched and helped this gem get repolished, uh, we have a better appreciation for this incredible craft that we continue to carry on um, and for the ability to share it with all of you. Um, so if anyone's interested in learning more about Poabic pottery and our mission to enrich the human spirit through clay, you can visit our website at poabic.org. Um, and there you can also find out more information about the mentioned restoration of the Detroit Women's City Club. Olympia Development of Michigan actually made a, a video on the project, so if you want a deeper dive. And of course, if you're able, we'd love to see you at Poabic soon if you are in the Detroit area. Um, and more information about hours and details of your visit can be found on our site. Um, and again, thank you for having me. That's it. Great. Thank you both so much. Um, I'm glad we could pretty directly compare to women's clubs. I think that's rare that we were able to do that. And that wasn't even kind of on the agenda when I reached out to you both. So it was, it was great we could find that common ground. Really interesting.
Um, so taking it really far back, I guess, to your early days of a professional or artistic life, um, I'm curious what both of your first pre preservation or restoration experiences were, what they were like, and what about them made it kind of convincing to pursue that long term in one way or another? Whoever wants to go first. I'll dive in if Riley doesn't mind. Um, I think for us, we have a little bit of a different situation um, just because we kind of inherited this as part of our legacy. I actually kind of looked up after you passed along this question and I found that Poabic actually did our first restoration well over 90 years ago. And so I think that was something that um, has always, it's not really a main focus of our organization, but it's more about preserving and continuing the legacy um, and really any of our preservation efforts are on um, strictly historic Poabic um, installations. And for you personally, Annie, did you feel like there was any any moment in your younger professional life where you were like, oh, this is really interesting or this ties into my ceramic background and I want to do that like on a larger scale or be, did you see Puabic and want to be part of an organization like that that really valued that quality of work? Yeah, I think it's it's one of those things where I'm lucky to have found a job where um, or a thing in your life, you know, where you feel like there's all these little things that that feel like led you to that or made you appreciate it more. And so I have grown up in and around this tile work. I visited this organization when I was younger. Um, of course, it's not like I envision myself sitting here, but I've always had an appreciation for history and I kind of inherited that from my own family. So, yeah, I think all of the parts are here and I love that, you know, not only um, did we focus on a women's project today, but we're also a woman focused, uh, founded organization um, at a time that was long before she had the right to vote. So there's kind of all the right pieces here for me. Um, and then on top of that, preservation within a city like Detroit that's seen a lack thereof, um, it feels especially important for those of us that are kind of like doing that and caring about it. Um, and we've seen an incredible turnaround as buildings are getting restored throughout the city. So if anyone hasn't come to Detroit, it's pretty fantastic. So thanks, Bray. Great. Riley, can you tell us about your first experience or an experience that really well, yeah, yeah. motivated you? You asked you? me about that earlier and I was stumped, but I, I think the, the earliest thing that I can remember was uh, 1980 or 81. And you see, like the rest, I, I, I was just looking for interesting stuff and I stumbled into it because I was working for a, a decorator, designer, Don Wheatman in, in San Francisco. And uh, we got along really well. And he asked me if I could restore some tile work in his bathroom. Turned out to be California uh, art tile from Richmond, but I didn't know that then. But the point was there was some damaged tile and he suggested, why don't we get the contractor to take out the vanity, you harvest tiles, just like I was showing from that at the city club where he harvested some from a hidden source. So I don't even remember how exactly with probably a hammer and chisel, <laughs> I mean, I, at that time, I took them out, but but it was very satisfying. And and then when the thing went back, it was like it was a, it was whole again. Instead of it was like a, it was like a mouth with a few teeth missing, you know. Just and then it, then it brought it back and put it together. So I think that was the first, the first, and maybe like uh, less than twenty percent of what I do is restoration. But but I do restoration whenever it comes in front of me, and and I get calls periodically specifically for restoration projects um, or and or for tile removal for, for a museum or for a, a, a purpose like that uh, to take out a tile mural so it can be saved because what it's on is going to be destroyed. That's happened a few times and that's really satisfying. Okay, so taking these experiences back to the city club projects, um, is there like one specific challenge you each encountered on these city club projects that uh, was just super evident to you that this is going to be like a whole big learning curve and you know how did you how did you go about addressing that challenge well, uh, um, I, I think that the biggest challenge at the at the city club I, I, I did stuff there from about 
every year I think I work there on things from 2002 until 2019. And then there was a change of uh, general manager and, and two of the key people died and one retired. And we had such a great group. It was had to do with leadership, the person, the, the, the personal commitment of the people you're working with and the sense of like cooperate, cooperating really, it sounds corporate as a team, you know, and, and then, then it came down to a, a general manager who said, and I guess this is to, because of possibility of favoritism or corruption that everybody who works there has to give a fixed bid, a bid, bid competitive fixed bid. And they had artisans who had worked there for years and you don't know what you're going to encounter when you start to take stuff out. You don't know how long the process is going to be. It just didn't work anymore. And the key people weren't there. So the key people, just a great, great period with a great, a great group of people. Um, and, and during that time, the, the club went from from being a dying club to, 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 to uh, being a Ho historic Hotels of America member and filling all 42 former resident rooms consistently and having an income and 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 basically so it was a it was a adaptive reuse of a building that was very successful i mean they have a theater a restaurant a swimming pool a meeting rooms weddings are there all kinds of things but but uh, that was that's really their their lifeblood is the the hotel all right so um my turn <laughs> 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 I just realized uh, our biggest issue um, with this and, and our biggest challenge was really um, something I already mentioned, which was the glaze matching with us not being able to use any of the historic surfaces and a lot of the historic materials. Um, we kind of had to start from scratch there with a whole new um, kind of, you know, approach. Um, luckily, we have a, a ceramic materials engineer here on staff that helps to kind of formulate um, our glazes, but that's really, uh, you know, chemistry more than anything else. And so I would say that was one of our biggest challenges. Um, but, you know, we learned a lot during that process. And I think we were pretty successful in matching a lot of the glazes. Um, and then there's always just kind of the standard challenges with doing a, a replacement project is we always have to factor in things like shrinkage and um, even uh, room for error within the kilns. And so we often have to make far more tiles than the square footage we're actually replacing um, and have to kind of factor in things like shrinkage and, and a lack of historic materials that we can use. So a, a few curveballs in there, but um, we were really happy with the result. Okay. Um, we had a question from Jonathan Fisher about how Riley matches tile. Let me see. Yeah, well, okay, so the process is this, Wh whatever tile you're trying to match, take pictures of it and send it to any suspects who you, you think of who might be able to do it. In the, ca in the case of, uh, of the blue uh, drain board, that was uh, Mission Tile West in South Pasadena. They had done a couple jobs before that came out well, take a little while but but and they charged a hundred dollars for, for a glaze sample and i thought god that's too that's too little well at the berkeley city club it, it had become four hundred dollars and then when we put the order it had become six hundred dollars and on the next job they didn't do it anymore so uh, i've gone through a couple of different places uh, and and uh, now i'm sort of would be back to square one and it depends on what kind of tile it is when we get the, the the unglazed red clay tiles done, I've had them done from handcraft tile, and the handcraft tile was taken over by Malibu uh, Ceramics Works in factory in Long Beach, and got some from them. So it's just it's it's like, but the way the process works is, if the person looks at the photographs and says they take a crack at it, and what the terms are, then you've got a. a send some actual tile to them. They can't do it off a picture. They, they, they have to have the, the sample. And if there's variation, they have to have samples samples that express the variation that's there. So, uh, and the next time I do it, it's gonna be uh, starting from square one. And in fact, I'll be asking around and I'll be you know trying to, trying to find where my source is. Mm -hmm. we, we did some Pratt and Larson for, for in, in the year 2000 at the Berkeley City Club at the swimming pool. They had a, there was a low budget then we did a replacement with a seafoam green and it was close enough it was pretty darn close and so that was a, that sort of was a freebie that fell in do it anyway okay um, mm -hmm. 
Interesting. Uh, I'm curious, are there any progressive preservation techniques that you think work well in conjunction with more traditional methods that you've noticed? And how do you go about marrying the two in harmony and like making it little like look seamless or I know Riley in your example, you're kind of like antiquing some of the tiles, like giving them a, a patina to match the surrounding. So have any progressive methods you both want to talk about? Well, I talked last, I could talk again. I mean, uh, the, the um, so, so the Berkeley City Club exploding doorway, the cracking doorways, that's something where, um, again, if you, if you were going to draw that in today, you would draw out where you're going to put the, the, the movement joints, the, the flexible joints. And so tile is something that tile and the whole tile assembly is strong, hard, brittle. It doesn't take movement very well. So bad things happen if it gets beyond its, its breaking point. So basically, and it's kind of like if you have a concrete sidewalk, it's scored at very intervals to try to crack in an organized pattern if possible. And you don't walk too many squares before you see maverick cracks that have that have that weren't where they were supposed to be. Anyway, so you have what you anticipate and then you have what actually happens. So in the in the case of the Berkeley City Club, it was very predictable generally where it would be at the at the at the doorways or if there's an L shape with a long elongated uh, uh, part of the feature, it's going to be right where that joint. Anyway, so, but, but the great thing is after it cracks, you know exactly where it cracked, where the stress concentrated. And it's even found its own place because it's, it, as it expands and contracts, that's the place that it, it now has stress release there because it created it by, by, by breaking. So you replace that with, with a, a you know, foam and, 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 and a, a rubber caulk. And then if you can make it look like, because the, the, it's for me, it's like, find the most functionally advanced way that you can solve a problem, but don't let it show on the surface. So the historic fabric is, remains intact. It's just, it's like Oakland City Hall, Berkeley City Hall, Hall I mean, uh, San Francisco City Hall, the Hearst Mining Building at Berkeley are all enormous buildings sitting on base isolators for seismic work. Well, that's not original. <laughs> they didn't have anything like that. But I'm totally 100% for it. If the funds are there, it's brilliant. Um, so the, the, the building is intact, and hopefully it'll stay intact the next time there's an earthquake because of that. Anyway, so it has to do with appearance rather than, rather than uh, so sometimes I'll run into the idea that like materials for like, you must replace with the same that was done originally. Uh, and, and, and I say it must appear the same as it did originally. So that's the end of my spiel on that. <laughs> Annie, have you come across any progressive methods that you thought were interesting? Yeah, I would I would say a lot of our progressive um, methods come more in on um, kind of the remaking of tiles uh, is again because that's usually where our main focus is um, as we have um, people that kind of help us with install and our main focus is you know how do we kind of you know to Riley's point remake these tiles but still um, you know respecting the history and blending in well with these um, historic spaces that we're working within. And so it's kind of interesting how we're still using like our 1912 clay mixer. Um, so there's still a lot of things that are really unchanged around here. Um, but we also might use 3D printing to help us better match a profile um, or better match something that um, fits that space or the patina of those tiles. Um, we also have invested in a few other pieces of equipment that kind of help to streamline the process in some ways, but aren't taking away that handcrafted element. So we might be using an arbor press that's exactly like what you would have seen here 100 years ago. Um, but the tile that we're pressing was 3D printed before it was put into the mold. So um, so we're kind of blending these kind of different layers of time within our process as well. Uh, but again, with the intention when we're doing restoration projects like this, um, to really respect that history and blend in as close as we can um, to the original design. Interesting. Um, so I think going with the idea of working with maybe someone outside of your organization or like bringing in a new person to address a specific issue, it might involve something like 3D printing, uh, kind of goes into my next question, which is about collaboration on these projects. And if you both could describe the process of working with other preservation experts and or 
uh, like community members who may be needing their voice involved in this process? Like, how do you go about those opinions and those other people in the industry? Well, so Berkeley City Club, the uh, I think the main collaboration is with a nonprofit organization, which is within the it's chartered within the the the, the, the business of the, the Berkeley City Club, which is the nonprofit uh, Berkeley City Club Conservancy, and they are tasked with overseeing uh, changes to the physical plant and, and approving them and so forth. I don't know all the intricacies of how uh, how it works. Obviously, there's going to be some conflicts, you know, and things like that, but but. Generally, I, I would I would be working almost. Sometimes I was working directly for the club, but mostly I was working through the nonprofit uh, conservancy. And um, so there, well, that that was especially good because we shared all the same all the same aims, which was to preserve it as a as you preserve a landmark building. As the Secretary of the Interior has his rules about how to treat uh, a, a historic building. Um, that's that's that was our. Uh, that was what the sort of thing that guided us, and there's going to be a little more conflict with it because they're they're a corporation that the the the, the building the building owner owns, but it, it, the buildings had benefited a lot from having from having that uh, the the nonprofit, and in fact they were the ones who instigated going through all the hoops and hurdles get, get to get to become a historic hotel of America, getting getting it uh, certified by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And that turned out, the, that turned around the, 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 the business. So they have got a lot of clout in that way. Anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, so I found for us, it's really just this really careful balance, like group project, right? Because we kind of have to be um, really respectful of the history and sometimes they're working within limitations of what we can do in certain spaces. Um, and, and again, our focus is always going to be respecting that original intention. We feel like when we do a restoration project, um, like we did with the Women's City Club, it feels like we're kind of collaborating with our founding staff um, that used to be here. So really, um, you know, as much as we can, we really try to kind of respect that original attention. But then again, we're always, you know, kind of taking in the desires um, by these preservation experts, uh, community members, or even developers sometimes that are taking on these projects. Um, and at the end of the day, for us, really, it always comes down to what is even possible within the ceramic process. And so um, that's always has to be kind of our, our guiding light um, in making sure that we're uh, again, using materials that are safe by today's standards and using processes to um, kind of blend all of that together. And so really no project is ever the same when we're taking something like this on. And I think that's kind of why we like um, doing that because it's it's always a little bit different, keeps us on our toes. Mm -hmm. um, so at both of these Women's City Clubs, uh, were there any specific tile or mosaic pieces that are extremely significant and any like motifs or distinguishing characteristics you both felt drawn to or thought were really unique? Well, the, 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 here's where there's sort of opposites because I, I love for a while, like I mean, Tile Heritage had a four day uh, uh, convention there in 1995. We saw so much stuff in and around Detroit at Wabi, it was fabulous. But the thing that's the opposite, I'm saying, because of budget and and so forth, and the realities of the of the project in the early depression years, there was that Julia Morgan did all her designs with off the shelf stock tiles, so it was all in the design and, and the choice of colors, and uh, she did great. And so you can get a long way with that. They were they were well made tiles, and I mean, I'd aspire to get, be able to go and buy buy the same uh, companies like American Caustic Tile and Company, giant corporation, but they. Where they were making really good quality tiles and, and and beautiful glazes and stuff, and so she worked with us straight straight off the shelf. It's interesting. I didn't know that. Annie, were there any standout motifs or tiles at the Women's City Club in Detroit? A lot of the um, the tiles there we found are in pretty simple geometric patterns, and as we saw in like primary and secondary colors, um, we saw the teardrop shapes around the windows or around the entry. Um, I think really uh, 
they the, the most significant thing about the tiles there is really Mary's involvement with the club. Um, Mary kind of had her hands in a lot of different things outside of Boabic pottery. Um, and so I think that's what's really kind of mostly unique about the tiles, but we also find those really interesting floral themes like we saw with that one drinking fountain. Um, you don't find those super often within Boabic pieces. It's usually found in like museums and places of learning. So that was kind of fun for us to go in there and, and find another floral theme. Um, but again, it was it was really Mary's history with that and that connection to our organization that made those tiles feel kind of extra special. Very cool. Um, okay, we're getting a lot of questions in the chat. Um, I think we'll start with um, for Annie. Do you know when the Detroit Women's City Club will be open? I am in Detroit. Great. Hello, Detroit friend. Yeah, I've been waiting to hear as well. So um, Olympia Development of Michigan started this and it was just before COVID that things were kind of really ramping up. And then um, during COVID, it kind of was a little bit quieter and we we really haven't found many updates since I even tried looking up even as, as um, this morning to see if there's anything in case it came up. So we're hoping to hear soon. I do know that they're getting close to being finished and um, we're really excited for people to see the tiles um, that we help to bring back to life. So hopefully soon and we'll announce it on our website and throughout our social media um, when that does happen. Another question is, um, is there a history of particular tile designers and any outstanding or particularly well-known individual tile designers? I think, Riley, if you could repeat the San Francisco designer you started with. Oh, uh, oh well, that John Wheatman was a, a all-around designer, not specific to tile. So. But I'd say that um, in terms of designing tiles, artistically, for instance, there's in the in the Bay Area, but but before World War II, there were eight art tile manufacturers and of different 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 le artistic levels. And my absolute favorite is Solon Schemmel. Uh, Albert Solon was just a, a ceramic genius, and he did all this all the designs and just did. And he he didn't like to do individual tiles; he liked to do entire panels. Uh, I remember him saying <laughs> with nice decorative tiles that were set that were set uh, in intervals on a building as a, a sort of architectural uh, sort of decoration. He said they look like they're stuck on like postage stamps. He wanted to do he he loved uh, Persian and Middle Eastern tile work, but he didn't do styles in that style. But he did whole whole panel installations uh, and very very all kinds of subtlety, all kinds of so. And and I'd say ninety percent of the tiles were set within fifty miles of his factory. He never had national distribution, so he's this sort of regional treasure here. In, in the, although he dominated the high end market in San Francisco in the twenties, but but was relatively unknown elsewhere. A little bit in L.A. Um, um, Riley, there's another question for you. Um, if there are any recommendations on reuse of 1970s ceramic tile on a building about to be demolished? Well, I mean, the first thing I say is, well, send me pictures. <laughs> um, uh, Do you have your email? Um, uh, Lisa, I think his email is in, it might not be in the yeah. um, posting actually, but. Okay. If you well, can type your email Doty, in, um... and my company is Doty Tile, so it's D-O-T-Y-T-I-L-E at gmail.com. Um, yeah. yeah, we'll add that to the chat for yeah. reference. And, and, and there, there, when, it, when it comes to removing and salvaging tiles, there, um, if the tile is very hard-bodied and robust and the joints are, say, between eighth of an inch and a quarter of an inch, it's practical to to extract them. Uh, it, it's a little bit laborious. I've, I've I've taken apart <laughs> quite quite a few. If if the tiles are very uh, are, are the kind of um, dust pressed uh, industrial earthenware tiles that would be used, say in in glazed bathroom tiles and things like that. If you have a tile and you if you touch it to your tongue and it wants to hang for a half a second because of the porosity, you can feel it. That's a tile that you, you're going to have a lot of trouble, especially if it's got tight joints. And so it's a matter of usually it comes down to it's a labor of love 
it's not something that's going to be economically viable that you're going to take it out and sell it and recoup uh, and keep the difference. It's it's just uh, it's for the sake sake of preserving something because there's something that catches your eye or something that seems Im important about it. And of course, by now the 70s are just getting into where the 50 year period is kicked in, uh, kicking in uh, for for uh, you know people considering things historic, but but uh, and it, it sort of depends on. Uh, on, on the quality of the tiles as, as far as what whether it's worth it and that's kind of subjective mm -hmm. yeah I, I could i could talk i could talk about the particulars if i see the tile a little more yeah i think john shared your email in the chat so okay, okay. hopefully someone shares this with you um i have a few questions for annie now uh would puabic create tiles for someone outside of detroit like is it typical that you do you get a lot of requests for projects elsewhere yeah um yeah so we we ship tile um internationally even and um and we really are just focused on making the tile so we no longer install our tile i did see one question come in um also if if we had historically done that so um, our staff used to make the tile and install it themselves and today we only focus on tile manufacturing and so um, so that way we can ship our tile kind of anywhere throughout the world. And we have, and we do, and we're lucky to kind of do that. Um, I think the furthest that we've shipped our tiles to New Zealand, which was pretty neat. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so we would certainly make tile for Riley. We'd make tile for anyone that wanted some. Um, and, and, but yeah, we do not do our own installation today. Could I interject a follow-up question to that? For something like the New Zealand projects where you're shipping tile, is that usually restoration work or is that someone who's just you know is very fond of the work that your company does and wants to put in a new wants to put a new tile somewhere yeah it's it kind of both usually, usually that um restoration is a really small part of what we do a lot of the time the only restoration projects we're taking on is um to kind of help bring back to life historic tile installations done by our very own organization um, but we're uh, continually operating um, tile manufacturing facilities, so we are creating new projects all the time. I just saw a beautiful iridescent fireplace laid out um, just yesterday here. So, um, so we are continuing to make new projects as well. Um, and again, using a lot of the same um, processes and, and even tools and equipment that our founding staff would have used. So good question. Thanks. And there was a question about the mosaic behind you, Annie, on your in your screen. Um, so in that case, would the designer be the same person who made the tile and laid the tile? Or did the designer give his drawing to a tile fabricator? Um, no, so we design and make the tile. And that's what it would have done uh, been done here historically. So our founder, Mary, uh, wore a lot of hats here. So she formulated the glazes, designed the projects, made the tiles fired the tiles, and then had workers to help her install them. And so um, so while we still do a huge part of that today, the installation part is the thing where we get a little bit of help, um, but we actually have a design team here that designs um, different tile profiles and, and different embossed tiles. Um, they'll design custom projects like backsplashes and fireplaces and things like that. Um, and then we have a fabrication team that makes them. So we are a really multifaceted organization. We don't look that big from the outside. And I know I kind of breezed over it, but we have over 50 employees here kind of carrying out different facets, including even an education program. So we've been collaborating with the Detroit public school system for like over 100 years, bringing ceramics into the schools too. So, um, so yeah, we kind of try to do as much of it as we can. That's great. Thank you. Um, Riley, another question for you about the chipped tiles in the residence rooms of the city club when it's a hotel. Um, do they need to be completely replaced or were there ways to spot repair? Um, um, and... Those are three quarter inch by three quarter inch uh, sort of porcelain ceramic. And um, the, so I, I, the supply I used was from American Restoration Tile in Arkansas, who, who uh, makes uh with old-fashioned equipment makes pretty much it and, and they can they can set for instance oh they at the swimming pool that, that was their tile too and i asked them to uh face mount it so it was so there wasn't any interference with any netting or anything at the bottom 
because it was immersed in water and to set it at 1 32nd of an inch normally they'd be they'd do a more to the 16th of an inch but I was there so they're able to do stuff like from the old days now the match is close you know you can see little differences uh in in, in color but but it's but it's very very close so um the, the case where i would where if there are larger chips in, in tiles um filling and painting is usually good now if it's on a floor and it's going to get foot traffic painting but the uh, uh, tough enamels uh, really hold up for decades uh, and 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 so that's normally the way to go that in fact a chip is easier to hide that way than a crack it's hard to make a crack disappear you can only see that the crack was cared for intended to but it, it's, it's a crack um yeah, yeah but the, so the little ones and and, and with the, with the with the uh, with the grout uh, dig it out uh, with a couple of methods with a fine tool or by hand and and bad places and then put it in with a a, a really uh super super head mix uh, uh, a, a additive uh, which I think will last a lot longer than it than the first time around um, that's a story in itself so I won't get started. resilience yeah mm -hmm. how do you decide to try and restore the original tile versus replacing it with like tile well, well, there on that scale, it, it would be really pretty impractical to try to to try to repair, 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 repair. It's easy just to simply take them all out and and, and replace them. Um, if if it's a a larger tile, and, and especially if it's a decorative tile, and you'd have to you'd be faced with reproducing something that's very complex, it's uh, that that shifts over clearly into the side of of a make an on-site, you know, a repair on it. And I have gone through a couple of different people. I have somebody that who, who does the, the painting or sometimes she fills it, sometimes I do the filling and she does the painting, but uh, uh, she's, I, I, I've done, I've done filling and painting in some cases. And it's either one of two things happens. Either I go, wow, that really looks good. Did I really do that? Or damn, I, I just can't get that to look the way I want it to. <laughs> So anyway, I know people who are better than I am at that. Yeah, I'm sure it's a very precious process. <laughs> um, another question for Annie uh, is, if you, do you have any stories to tell about the complex restoration work of tiles or designs by architect Eliel Sarnin at Cranbrook? Yeah, great question. It's always one of my favorite places to talk about because um, I went to Cranbrook before I knew I would end up here. So it's always kind of a nice overlap. Um, back in the, um, I think it was the early 2000s, Boabic uh, did a pretty large uh, restoration, which was largely a tile replacement almost entirely um, of an installation that they now call Rainbow Fountain at Cranbrook. Um, for those that aren't familiar with the Cranbrook educational community, um, this was at one point a private residence. Um, by George Booth, who expanded to having a, a girl, a boy school, and then a girl school, and then eventually um, they have a master's of art program within the campus. It's a pretty incredible campus located just north of Detroit. Um, and there's Poavic tile throughout um, the majority of the historic structures, including uh, Rainbow Fountain, which is an, an exterior fountain located near the Booth estate, um, which also in, contains an incredible amount of historic tiles uh, by Poavic. The water there at Cranbrook turns out has quite a bit of iron in it, and um, I, I kind of showed a really brief uh, photo earlier, but Poabic was really known for our iridescent glazes, which are these kind of really metallic um, uh, glazes that change quite a bit depending on the lighting conditions and angle you're looking at them from, but they're also really soft glazes. They were low fired. We actually fire our glazes a lot higher today to make them a little bit more um, safe to the elements, but the soft glaze surface plus the um, large amount of iron in the water there at Cranbrook um, meant that the tiles um, were damaged pretty much beyond repair. And again, Michigan has some pretty harsh winters. I'm jealous of all of you in California over there. Um, and so there are certain times, especially if a tile is, is laying to a point where ice can collect, um, it doesn't really have a long shelf life here. And so when Cranbrook approached us back in the 2000s, we took on this really large um, you know, kind of a replacement restoration project 
uh, trying to as closely match as many of the original designs of the tiles that um, were put in by by Mary Chase uh, Stratton when she did that back in the 1920s. So, um, so Rainbow Fountain, if you see it anytime, um, which we do have photos on our website at poavic.org, uh, it is all newer tiles, all of it now. Um, but there is a good amount of the historic tiles still there on the campus. So if you ever are in the Detroit area, um, Cranbrook is another place that's really worth a visit. Um, incredible architecture, incredible sculpture, and um, at least in my opinion, some really great tile work. So, Okay, and last question, Riley, what is the saddest vintage tile loss story that you know of that should have been preserved? Or this could be for both of you, actually. Um. I think I tried to bury those in my mind because there's been more than a few. Um, uh, maybe uh, give me a minute. Maybe something will pop into my head. <laughs> Suppress them usually. I'll start with my sad story then, while Riley uh, gets his ready. Um, it, it, I'm sure I'm sure some of you have heard of the city of Detroit before, and we're really not really well known for maintaining our historic structures, especially in recent in, in past decades. Again, as I mentioned, there's been um, a really huge attempt at kind of preservation here in more recent years. But um, Detroit went through several decades where there were a lot of buildings that were torn down um, and a lot of them that contain Poabic tile work as well. We are lucky to have made a lot of friends in our 120 years. So sometimes tiles were ripped straight out of walls on demolition day and brought down here to Puabic. So if you ever do visit us, you can actually see some wall chunks of, you know, installations that came back here. Um, but I think some of the hardest ones for me to always um, process are the, the uh, schools and places of learning. The, the boom and bust of Detroit meant that there was an incredible amount of schools put in here in the 20s and 30s and 40s. Um, and at one point, there were over 60 Detroit public schools that contained Poavic tiles. Um, and so there's far less schools here today, that, um, but we, we do still find them every once in a while. So I've been spending the last couple of years kind of clicking around all the old schools here, trying to find what we can. Um, so I would say for every heartbreak we find, then we find another gem hiding somewhere. Um, so again, I've been just trying to spend the last few years tracking down um, whatever is remaining and at the very least documenting it through photographs. And if not, um, maybe even in some cases, removing it from the building entirely to bring here. Yeah, I guess I, I, I think more of the successes than the failures because you kind of... Uh, Psychologically, it's okay. You have to turn the page, but uh, for instance, in 1999, went to uh, to Erie, Pennsylvania, to old, the old East High School, which was going to be torn down the next year, and took out 12 really beautiful uh, fountain backs, and and um, and then they were put into the new school, and this is in like a blue collar, mostly immigrant labor uh, type of youth, uh, that it, it, not a fancy place, but they re they resurrected a. Uh, an alumni association. They raised money. They got a twenty thousand dollar budget by by getting people to um, to, to, to pay twenty five dollars each for for a commemorative brick, of which five dollars was was for making it, and the other twenty. Anyway, so they got a thousand got a thousand uh, bricks, and 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 with that, uh, so it's just totally grassroots. And I mean, I, I guess I'd rather think about that than the the the, the, than, than the losses. There's right right, right now. There's a the University of Illinois Champaign has has a uh, Pico uh, pa panels that are endangered, and you can see if you go on the Tile Heritage website and stuff. I think you I think you'd find uh, information about that. Uh, so that's right now on the balance. There's a big campaign going. That's either going to be a an inspiring story or a tragic loss. Anyway, it happens. <clears throat> yeah, I'm from Cincinnati, and there I remember a lot of high schools and other public schools having these Rookwood tile fountains that are really stand out. So yeah, that's probably the biggest losses for me too. Thank you both well, for sharing. Sorry, Lisa, yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. I was just going to say, hopefully both of your hard work will have more success stories than, uh, than sad stories moving forward. Um, 
Thank you again, uh, Riley and Annie, for being with us today. An incredible program, incredibly insightful. I'd love to pick both your brains for three more hours, but unfortunately, this is our time for today. Uh, thank you also, Braden. You did a great job pulling this program together and moderating. It was really wonderful to have you working on this. Uh, to our audience, on behalf of the California Preservation Foundation, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the program, and we welcome you to leave feedback uh, and suggestions for future programs. Uh, when upon closing your Zoom window, you'll be redirected to a very brief two-minute survey that'll give you an opportunity to give us this feedback. Uh, we also hope to see you at one of our upcoming programs. Uh, we have part two of our three-part historic review ordinances and districts training coming up on April 2nd, uh, as well as a program on stained glass with Judson Studios on April 18th. Uh, in addition to many more programs, you can find information on all of these on our website at CaliforniaPreservation.org. And again, while you're there, we encourage you to join as a member if you're not already one. Uh, thank you all again so much, Riley, Annie, amazing program. And uh, we hope to see everyone again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.